All right, welcome back. I hope everyone's ready to think, talk, share, and really push us forward. This morning and this afternoon, we really want to spend some time digesting um, what we heard on that great panel with lots of great ideas and a touch on a number of important aspects of this issue in terms of the infrastructure itself and why we even fund or value science communication. Um, we're hoping, especially on our round table, to really now move past an exploration of all these issues to think about where do we go from here? What can we do? Can we do anything? If we do do something, are there a few things that uh, maybe rise to the top of things we should focus on as we're trying to advance our building of the sustainable infrastructures of life science? So we're going to spend about the next 45 minutes um, before lunch trying to get some thoughts out of your guys' head and everyone online who is watching as well. Um, and so we're going to embark on one of Compass's favorite things to do, which is fun group exercises that involve note cards, talking, writing, thinking, and sharing with each other as a way to get more out of you guys and make sure that we're all having a chance to really share some of the things that we're thinking about that's hard to say in front of a microphone in two minutes when you have your chance. So we have um, a question for you all. All right, here is the million dollar question. If you had unlimited resources, funding is not an option. As we have said in other meetings, funding is a pathway, not an obstacle, so let's not think about it as a limitation. But if you had unlimited resources and you had funding as a pathway, what would you even invest in in life science communications and engagement? And so I'd really like to have everyone here and who's online to take about five, six, seven minutes to just really think about this. And I'd like you all to try to come up with the three things that you think that we should invest in. And for those of you that are here in the room, um, hopefully you grabbed a note card on your way in. And if not, let us know and we'll deliver you some. If you could write down one thing you think you, we should invest in on one note card and um, use three note cards, so three things. So three things on three note cards. One thing per note card. <laughs> If you're online, if you could um, either tweet some ideas you have and use the hashtag NAS interface, that would be great. And if you're online watching but you're not on Twitter, then get a Twitter account. Um, but in the meantime, um, you can email your thoughts to me and I'll check my email. We'll make sure that your thoughts get included in how we're thinking about this collectively. My email is brooke, with an E at the end, dot smith at compassonline.org. So just take um, you know, five to eight minutes and think about this and write down your three thoughts. And we'll regroup and talk about it in a few minutes. Is everyone about done? All right, so the first question I have for you all is, was that an easy or hard thing to do? Or the first one was easy, but the rest of them were hard? <laughs> Reactions? Okay, good question. <laughs> so easy for Erica. <laughs> no, hard because I needed more cards. I could have kept writing forever. No, 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 but I think we're only allowed to have three. <laughs> There's so many things that I would do if I had sufficient funding. Okay, so a little hard, a little easy. Okay, I'd love to hear some of your favorite ones. Who wants to start sharing a few? Yeah, Martin. You need to go to a mic so everyone online can hear you. <laughs> I'm breaking my hip. Um, trying to destroy somebody else's bag. <laughs> so one is uh, picking up on the model of our own roundtable here is uh, to have local, like we have local agenda 21s in Europe um, to talk about local sustainability issues, to have local dialogue um, uh, institutions set up uh, to discuss with local communities um, questions that around life science issues, potentially broader than life science, but it's the idea of having, having local, uh, how do I call that, local citizen dialogue um, infrastructure set up. But around the scientific issues itself, not around science communication, correct? It's probably broader because mm -hmm. you couldn't get it just for science communication, but science communication ought to be, um, a com I mean, the, the problem is that is the science communication. Yep. 
So it's, the idea is not to talk about science communication, but to do science communication in these things. In other words, it's an engagement model. Got it. That has been tested uh, in other places. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Andy. Um, this is a variation on that, but you know we have uh, organizations like uh, NCs that have been designed to synthesize information on a particular topic, uh, now succinct at, at Maryland, but you actually could create some centers uh, that were you know, to pull working groups together on how to communicate a set of results around a particular societal problem. Um, where the focus would not be to do new research, but to develop the actual communication vehicles mm -hmm. and to do the communication itself in a working group setting that was not affiliated with an individual institution, so it's not marketing for an institution. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bruce. I, I'd like to see um, some way to help more scientists learn and then use some of the science of science communication. But, so what would you pay for? <laughs> uh, I suppose it's some form of training uh, workshops or, or something like that, but I'm not sure that that's, I, I'm not sure yet what the model is. Mm -hmm. I just know that that's the goal of what I would like to spend the money on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, Bill. And can you identify yourself before you speak, because people sure. online won't know who uh, you are. I'm Thank you. Bill Provine with DuPont. Actually, I'll take a poll first. Uh, is anybody from industry here today? Oh, okay, that's me. Okay, <laughs> excellent. Uh, hopefully there's many online and out there, so I encourage the people who are out there uh, online, if they're from industry, please chime in and, and help out the, my, my mission here. Um, so three things I guess I came up to share quickly. I mean, to me, it's fundamentally about, I'm worried today that people don't understand science enough. Even if we communicate in generic terms, they don't get it. So K through 12 STEM education is going to still be critical. We've got to get people more science savvy. Uh, and able to understand just the basics of that and really engage in, in STEM education in a way that shows the application of science. What can science create? Not just like, you know, here's how to do math or here's, you know, you know uh, make it tangible, at least showcasing the, the results. And uh, teacher training, of course, is an important part of that. I, you know, I have personal passion for engagement of industrial scientists in public forums. We tend to not do that at all, uh, a variety of reasons. Um, I think uh, it could be done a lot better. Uh, again, to showcase what science can create, you know, is creating, what has created, and what it can create. And I think face-to-face -face interactions are optimal. You know, get people out there, get to see them as people, the people who are out there with a passion and you know, a true um, basic fundamental drive to, to do good uh, out there. Last one is I, I say make, enable science to go viral. Uh, really invest in social media groups and sites, and with that, uh, put the power, or at least engage the power of, of university students to help propel the message within the new media platforms that, that will spill over into other groups as well. So those are my three. Bill, can I push you on that last point a little bit? Sure, please do. Push so away. If, if, you, if you could give money right now to make that happen, help science go viral and on social media platforms, what specifically would you be funding or who would you be funding? What does that look like to you? Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of it actually is, is just funding, I, I think, infrastructure to um, have people. I mean, a lot of the social media is, is free access. Mm -hmm. So it's about getting people to set up and, and, and um, coordinate, you know, uh, you know, run groups, you know, uh, to, um, you know, build forums. And to, 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 to engage people in the, the content development. Some of it, you know, you don't want it all to be just like pushing one agenda, but how do you get people to, to just, there's great information that's out there, it's just not shared. Yeah. So to me, it's, it's, it's just building those portals to take what's already there, but get it, in, get it, get it out there more aggressively. Okay. Um, well, Twitter, Facebook, I mean, I do want, you know, um, you know the, the ones that also have the, the broadest appeal, right? So I think, you know, Twitter and Facebook come up, you know, in the business community, of course, LinkedIn we use a lot, but that's not as relevant, I don't think, to the general public. Um, and so there's a, a number of others as well. I'm not quite sure how successful others, but I think Twitter and Facebook definitely would be keys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ida Chow, I would just say one of the three that I think is very important is to train or teach journalists, all of them, not only the scientists, science journalists, about the scientific process, and that not equal time should be given to every issue. Things need to be based and have the proper uh, perspective. 
Great, thanks, Ida. Yeah, Mary. Can I um, add something to what Ida just said, uh, Mary Woolley? Uh, I, I wrote down that uh, we should fund all journalism schools, schools of journalism, um, I, to have robust science programs, science journalism, and that would cover the process question, you know, the scientific process. But to get, not to expect uh, necessarily that we can get to all working journalists right now, but we certainly, there are ways I think that we can um, infiltrate, if you will, into people who want to be journalists. Mm -hmm. Great. And, and I just add, because it totally surprised me when I learned it, um, that a couple of deans of journalism schools have told me that enrollment is way up. Hmm. That journalism has changed dramatically, and young people want to be part of it. Hmm. So hmm. it's not a dying breed at yeah, all. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, David. Is that working? Yeah. 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 Oh, that's sort of <laughs> gained. Um, volume. Um, I, a, a couple of things. Um, I would figure out some way to independently support uh, popular science journalism. And, you know, that's somewhat self serving mm -hmm. being in that field. But, um, you know, as we've talked about, uh, you know, in this meeting and other meetings that, that the roundtable has had, um, you know, the, the science journalism is under great threat right now because, you know, the, the funding changes and uh, drop in advertising and all the other factors. And I just wonder, I mean, it, it, it makes me a little nervous to propose this because you, know, you don't want a lot of people controlling what can be said, but you have to have those, that independent voice. And since we're talking about you know, limitless funds here, mm -hmm. some way to support um, you know, the great uh, publications out there that we all need. Um, if you don't have an independent voice, uh, then it just becomes an echo chamber of various groups talking. And the second one is uh, something that uh, Susan Greenfield, who used to run the Royal Academy over in Britain, as Oxford, once proposed. Uh, and I, I don't know whatever happened to that, but it's something she called the Science Corps, which would be like a Peace Corps, uh, but not necessarily overseas. It could be anywhere where you would get groups of scientists and fan out a, a, around the country, around the world, uh, to, to schools especially. Um, you know, would have this a big organized project where people would go out in a very concerted way. Because uh, as it's already been mentioned, I think if you don't start with especially, you know, K through 6, K through 12, uh, you don't have adequate science, you don't have adequate science communication. Mm -hmm. Great. Jeff, and remember to identify yourself, please. I'm identifying myself. I'm Jeff Hunt from the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Uh, People have already mentioned two of mine, but the third I would say is to increase research budgets so that funding for science communication is incorporated into research grants. It's now <coughs> sort of seen as additional to what you're doing as research, and since so much of research grant funding is funding people, if you made the funds bigger, then people would have the amount available to do science communication efforts in addition to their research. Love it. <laughs> Erica, all ten of them, let's hear them. <laughs> well, if I was in a, um, so and introduce yourself, please. One of the things, oh yes, Erica Shugard, American Society for Microbiology, and one of the things that I think is really hurting the field is the fact that um, practitioners, whether they be scientists or people in the field, don't publish anything about their work. It's only the researchers that really publish. So I think creating methodologies and publishing mechanisms for practitioners of <coughs> communication of science um, is an infrastructure that we really need, and I. Um, know that we all love meetings here in D.C., so I think it's important to provide more opportunities for science communicators in different fields, journalism, museums, researchers, to exchange ideas and form collaborations. I've worked across several different fields, and I know that nobody, the museums don't talk to the journalists, don't talk to the online people, don't talk to the researchers, and there's not a lot of places for the people to actually come together and do that. So mm -hmm. those kind of, I think that would help a lot as well. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, Adam Fagan with the Genetic Society of America. Just to sort of add on, I think, uh, to 
uh, Jeff's uh, suggestion about sort of grants and stuff. I mean, we have some mechanisms, but I think the idea is that people aren't really held accountable to reach uh, any level of excellence and, and competency in those areas. Yeah. That I think a lot of the things, particularly through uh, NSS broader impact thing, are well intentioned, but perhaps not particularly effective. And why can't we take the same rigor there? Um, the other thing that if money were truly uh, unlimited, this is more about sort of expanding uh, science awareness and stuff generally, but um, I think about the effect that things like CSI has had for forensics and if one could actually get into the popular culture with something popular, with something that had embedded in it some of the science concepts, that would be good. So we could develop TV shows and movies and other popular <laughs> press things that insidiously get at what we're looking at. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Nick. <laughs> I'm echoing one I wrote practicing, having a practicing scientist in every science class. I have a sister who's a middle school science teacher and it lights up the kids and I've worked with researchers who do these programs and okay. they find it as rewarding as anything else. And the flip side of that is uh, more courses on communicating science for science students, both undergrad and grad. Yeah, yeah I'm going to um, use moderator privilege here to share one of mine, <laughs> which is related to that too. Um, and one of the things a few of us have talked about in other meetings, which is for graduate students of science, um, any field of science, STEM education, that the grants that they get from, let's say, NSF um, include funds to make sure that they have training in communications so that they're held accountable to it, much like they need to learn statistics, they also need to learn core competencies of science communication. Andy. Just on that, there are things um, that are f quite successful, I believe, called preparation of future faculty programs for a lot of graduate students. You could have a parallel kind of program, which was, it's not just a course in science communication, but it's a set of, of skills and activities that you have to go to build a portfolio that say, I've completed a preparation of future faculty program, which you know people then put on their resumes when they compete for jobs. Mm -hmm. Um, you could do the same kind of thing for science communication, incorporating what you just said. Yep. Okay, we're just going to do a couple more, and then we'll have time to share with each other in a more casual setting. Erica? I just want to share one, which and, is... And who are you? Um, <laughs> Erica Goldman from Compass. Um, to be able to provide a uh, know your audience consultant to every scientist who needs to write a broader impacts mm -hmm. statement for NSF to help them really kind of to address Amanda's point, figure out not just... Uh, how to get out their results, but to actually how to communicate them effectively to the right target audience. Great. And Amanda. Oh. Okay. This is more of a goal than a, uh, uh, the funding gonna, strategy has you. yet to be worked out. <laughs> but um, uh, to protect the integrity of science communication at, at universities, agencies, NGOs, industry, what have you. But we, I would think we need to enshrine that scientists need to be able to speak freely and openly about what they find wherever they happen to be working. Is there anything you would fund to do that besides Andy? <laughs> yes, <laughs> give a lot more money to Andy over there. Um, I, I think the scientific societies uh, mm -hmm. can play a big role there. It's a, it's a cultural shift and a policy shift. Mm -hmm. um, so it would take a, um, concerted work on, on the part of, of a lot of different groups but I think the, the uh, scientific societies, groups like UCS, and, and, and perhaps some of the internal people, uh, uh, the, um, some of the uh, employees at agencies who are frustrated with the current situation, I should say. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, on that note, we'll end with. Exactly. Yep. yep. So, Rick, why don't you give us your last thoughts and then we'll spend some time connecting about it. So given unlimited funding, I would probably spend a lot more dollars than we currently are on what I consider to be gateway drug citizen engagement projects in science, particularly at the youth level. And by gateway places, I think about things like Christmas bird counts, other life sciences activities like gardening, natural history, but also ast astronomy, astrophysics, a lot of things that kids can do and actually be engaged in the scientific process in a real and lively way. But I would specify that at least 15% of those funds go to formative and evaluative research. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do now is um, I want to spend some time getting an idea of the major themes that we have out there. So I'm going to ask that we spend, I'm hoping we can do this in about 
10 minutes if we're efficient. But if everyone could get up, and what we'll do is we'll come over to these boards, and I want you to put your cards on the board, but I want you to do it, what's that? Carefully. Carefully? Are they sticky? No, they Okay, got it. How are we attaching them? Uh, okay, we, okay, Katie has push pins. So what we're gonna do is, um, not just put your cards up and walk away, but put your cards up, read what else is up there, and our goal together as a group is to try to clump like things. So as cards start going up, cards might move around, and you have license to move around other people's cards as you, things, as you see things change and as you get up there. So you'll have to read what other people put up there, maybe talk to your neighbor about what it might mean and what it, how it relates to yours, but ultimately in about 10, 15 minutes, if we can do it, um, try to get them all up there and we'll see where we coalesce and where all the ideas are and you can learn more about your colleagues' ideas. And then we'll reconvene here. We have another few minutes to just chat and one more exercise before we break for lunch. So I'll call you all back in 10 to 15 minutes. And those of you online, just be patient. <laughs> It'll be quiet over here for a while. <laughs> Okay, all right. Okay, so what we're gonna do now before we break for lunch is revisit the major themes that came up and think about if you actually were to invest in them, how many dollars you might put towards some of these things to really get a sense of, it's not just the fact that we wanna do these things, but if you have limited resources, where do you sort of put your money? So I did a quick summary of the things up there, and I apologize if I missed a nuance of something you put while trying to do this really fast, but I'm gonna quickly go down the list of what the major themes seem to be up here. We're going to attribute a bucket to each thing, and everyone that came here in person today received uh, 10 coins when they entered the room, and so we're gonna ask folks before they head to lunch to come and spend their money. And you can put your money all in one bucket, distribute it evenly, but put your money on the things that you um, think needs to get done at the value in which you ascribe to those things. So I'm gonna go through the things that were up there and these are somewhat in order of the ones that had the most cards around it to ones that are more one-off ideas. That's not an indication of their waiting right now, but just to give you a sense of where the room was thinking about things. So the first thing that um, folks talked about that there were a lot of cards up there around are communications trainings and communication skills for science, whether done through um, research grants um, or other kinds of grants to make sure that scientists have access to get core competencies. Um, the other, I swear I didn't know this was gonna happen, is boundary organizations. <laughs> um, and the way that one of you said it, which I loved, um, is a match.com for scientists to help scientists find their relevant audience. Um, <laughs> There is a, a number of cards up there about investing in our reward system for scientists. I don't know what specifically one would pay for, but enough of you said that that needs investment in. So we'll put that one there. Um, investing in uh, scientists being more active in uh, K through 12 education. And I know that that's a huge field. I feel like this room has more focused around connecting scientists to those classrooms or the idea like the scientist core that you said, David, I think that that's, it's not just invest in K through 12 education, it's specifically getting scientists to um, that level of um, education. Journalists getting access to science, scientific training, whether it's in journalism school or while they're on their job going to um, professional programs or having access to um, scientific workshops and scientists. Um, community dialogues that include scientists, like Martin's idea of a more kind of cafe or round table of local communities in engaging with scientists around issues that they care about. Um, CSI for science. Invest in rebranding science. Oh, and then this one um, I just put up at the end, but this did have a few more than these last few, which is um, just simply funding journalism and way people's, people can convey information, whether it's traditional media or new media, because that's really important for folks to, um, a, as a way for science and scientists to engage. Okay, so here are our buckets. So um, we are gonna take about an hour break and have lunch, which is in here? Yep, yep right here, so it's really easy. 
So in the next hour, come up and spend your dollar, go grab lunch, and then when we come back at 1 o'clock, um, we'll kind of talk about all these things and what's feasible, what's possible, and then have a great discussion um, that David is going to facilitate for us um, at the end of the day to just really think about where do we go from here and what can we do. So thanks for spending your money on science. Enjoy lunch, and we'll be back here. Science communication, engagement. <laughs> All right, and for those of you who are watching online, we'll reconvene here at 1 o'clock Eastern Time. Thank you.